This is a Global Original Podcast. As you can hear from the echoey sound of my voice, I am speaking to you from the room where the government keeps its real interest in fish. There's nothing in here. This week's podcast is fact-heavy, with almost no fake news at all. And that's not fake news. Coming up, some excellent advice about bunnies. But first, a bloke with a great accent calls up to tell me about cows and boats. Okie dokie. 0345 Here's calling Glasgow. Hello, Mike. Oh, hello. Hi. Mike. Uh, thank you. Uh, nice to talk to you, Nick. Uh, I just called to say that... Um, you love me. You know, people... <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm just calling to say that you know these uh, protesters they keep banging on on like airliners and you know they cause a lot of pollution and stuff. Yeah. But I was looking at one website here. It's called Eight Tag. Um, it's called what? And Eight Tag. Eight Tag. T yeah A T A G dot org. A T A T dot org. Yeah, and um, well, they say that you know, airline put, uh, pollution all over the world caused like only two percent of carbon emissions of you know the man-made carbon emissions, just two percent. Yeah. On the other hand, you have you have cows, <laughs> 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 which produce yeah. a lot more mm-hmm. um, carbon emissions. Yeah, but you can't get from here to America on a cow. I know. So it's much better to get in a plane, and you're not going to use as much CO2. (laughs) Yeah, well, it would be a good idea if everybody went uh, vegetarian. Let's not say vegan, because that would be maybe a step too far. But uh, can we persuade people to eat a little bit less meat, you know, on uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday? Treat treat yourself on Friday and Saturday, and maybe have nothing at all on a Sunday. I mean, we could always uh, uh, stand to lose a little bit of weight. Am I right? Well, I believe you're right. I think people will be healthier and... uh, it will contribute a lot. Uh, I just don't understand why, you know, they keep, like, you know, uh, banging on airlines. You know, they are, like, 12, 12 per, uh, 12% of carbon emissions produced by vehicles is from airliners. So you still have, like, 75% of cars and, you know, and buses that cause emissions. And then also you have all trains and, and ships around the world. Yeah, no. ships is a big one. People don't really think about ships, but they uh, create a massive amount of pollution. Ships do. It's just that they create yeah. it in a place where people aren't, um, where you can't see it. But just because it's, it happens at sea, don't mean it's, say it stays at sea. Yeah, but they're changing now. They're using um, gas instead of using heavy oil, oil, which causes a lot of pollution. They're not allowed to burn that kind of stuff anywhere anymore. You know, there are only a few countries around the world. Of course, China is one of them, and the U.S. is another. They can burn like heavy oil on on ships, but they have the rest, of, you know, people, Europe, mainly Europe. Um, you, you, if you're at port, you have to burn like uh, uh, diesel, which is less polluting than heavy oil. Is it? You know. Well, are you an expert in this regard? I know a thing or two, you know. <laughs> not a, I want to call myself expert. Right. Okay, well, that's uh, good, because we're not interested in the opinions of experts. All right, nice to talk to you. Thanks a lot, Mike. 0345 6060 973. On the other hand, Julian Wokingham says, ban barbecues and we'll hit our emissions targets, especially this weekend. The air is thick with them. i tell you what the air is thick with is uh, smog. I was up uh, high on the, uh, Thursday having a, uh, a beverage on a rooftop, and you could see over London to the, um, to the Docklands, except that you couldn't. From, and it was just near where the, protest, where the protest was happening. From where I was sitting, you could barely see the Docklands because it was shrouded with smog. Hang on, I'm going to cough. And that's probably because of all the smog. I mean, it won't help. And it was interesting that on the very same day that the press was fulminating about these hippies um, with their pink boat, that a report came out saying that you that um, you really shouldn't breathe the air. I mean, it really did say that. Don't go out. 
There's poison in the air. Warning, warning. Don't leave the house, they said. Here's a call in Durham. Hello, William. That didn't work, did it? Uh, I'll have to hit it harder. One moment, please. Oh, there it is. William. Yes, hello. Yes, sir. Um, I think it's a pity we don't talk about uh, nuclear fuel more uh, for, you know, electricity generation. You think it's a pity that people don't talk about it more? Yes, we don't utilise it because as much as, well, one consider it a fossil fuel, it's non-renewable, it is, if you discount the obviously obvious uh, nuclear waste, exceptionally clean. It doesn't produce any carbon emission. Well, that's, a bit of, uh, so that's a bit of a bold statement, though, isn't it, William? If you discount the nuclear waste... Obviously, and and you discount the uh, the potential for it exploding and killing all mankind. You know, a sm- small issue like that. Yes, obviously, but uh, if you look at the accidents, they are few and far between. Yeah, but huge though. Happens, when when an accident when a nuclear accident happens, then uh, entire swathes of the countryside are uh, unlivable, and we've got a relatively small island. So if uh, a nuclear explosion happens on a dungeon acid, for instance, or wherever else they've uh, got them, then uh, we'll, we'll all have to leave. We'll have to go and live in France. Well, I mean, if we hadn't handed over much of our nuclear power facilities to the French, that might not be an issue, and the Chinese. Um, well, it would, it would be an issue because it's still sighted here. Yes, of course. Um, obviously, nuclear disasters are catastrophic. But if we're talking purely about global warming... It really is a good option to reduce our carbon emissions compared to gas uh, and, and coal. I think there was a fellow who called last night, and um, maybe I gave him short shrift. He he was he was calling from Australia, and he was called Bruce, and I couldn't get past the fact that he was called Bruce and he was calling from Australia, and he didn't know why that was funny. Um, I refer you to Monty Python, the matching tie and handkerchief uh, album, and that will explain the reasons why I thought it was amusing. And he was saying pretty much the same thing as you. And uh, my objection was it seems like a halfway measure. It may be um, good to uh, reduce um, emissions in the short term, but it doesn't seem like a, a technology that is safe or desirable in the long term. Uh, yes, indeed. Um and, no, a pro- and the problem, if I may, where the problem with the nuclear power is that you're saddled with it for the long term, even if you only use it for the short term. Yes, you do have the aspect of decommissioning, etc. Yeah. Um, however, so let's say, let's look at gas quickly. Um, there really isn't an awful lot left. I am, uh, I'm a geology student, so it's what I study. Um, we've hit peak hydrocarbon production and discovery. It's going to run out really very rather soon. At the rate we're consuming it, we're in a lot of trouble. Now, nuclear power is tried and tested. Obviously, it has its risks, but it is efficient. It is fundamentally quite clean, and it is fundamentally quite safe as long as you do it properly. But isn't it phenomenally expensive? I mean, to the point that we can't afford to build our own nuclear power stations. We're having to beg the Chinese and the French to do it for us. Yes, that is a pity. It is expensive, but... In this day and age, anything really is possible if you stop, you know, not whinging about the cost, but look at the great <laughs> picture. It's, it's, it's difficult to say, oh, God, why can't we just do it? But yeah. if, we are, if we're serious about reducing our carbon emissions and meeting global targets, mm-hmm. I really do see it as a, as a legitimate option. The problem with renewables, I see, is, to, you know, to make sort of, let's say, turbines and what have you. It uses colossal amounts of rare earth elements, which are really bloody difficult to get out to the ground to find to produce is that the case with solar then i mean i don't don't know what uh, what uh, elements are required in a solar panel yeah it's it's really not as it's not as simple you know with a nuclear reactor yes you need your nuclear fuel and that's like actually lying about you can't go and pick up at the beach (laughs) but your rare earth elements well if if you can you're on the wrong beach yeah (laughs) your rare earth elements they occur in really Nasty, you know, nasty places, deepest Africa, South America, they're quite hard to get out of the ground when yeah. you do. You get the you know, environmental problems. All of your eco warriors will complain that you're digging up somebody's village, which is you know, legitimate. Um, and the people in that village have got to spend an entire lifetime um, uh, pulling a poison out of the ground for yes, uh, so just yes. so you can um, heat dinner or or well, use or use your mobile phone, for instance. Absolutely, absolutely. It infuriates me when people uh, bang on about awful corporations and you say, well, look at the amount of these rare elements. 
that are essentially from the black market getting into yeah. the clean market have been dug up by. As usual, William, the, the problem is us. We are not ethical consumers. We continue to buy things that we know are bad for us and are bad for our lifestyle and are bad for society, but we continue to do it because we like it and it's nice and uh, we don't want to be uh, deprived of amusements. And, you know, eventually we'll get the uh, the message, but, but by that time probably it would be a little bit too late. We'll, we'll act at the very moment that it's too late. <laughs> Mark it down in your diary. Thanks a lot, William. 0345 6060 973. You can text 84850, email nick a at lbc.co.uk, and if you're on Twitter, it's at LBC. Uh, nuclear power? No thanks. People of a certain age will recall that sticker in the back of every yellow VW Beetle on the road in the 1970s, along with Musicians Union says keep music live, and one for Brutus Jeans. Look them up on the internet, kids. Coming up, excellent advice regarding rabbits. What number are you calling from? I'm calling from 0345 6060 973. So the footballers took a break from the World Wide Wait from uploading pictures of their face. And um, in order to protest about being abused online, and the result was that they were abused online. Well, ain't that just great? Morons. We're surrounded by morons. Now, people think that it's the internet that has caused this, but I I don't buy that. I think that people have always been like this. It's just that the internet has facilitated them expressing their ire and their inner boiling fury and rage. But uh, thanks a lot, Tim Berners-Lee. You've made it uh, easier for people to uh, be rude. Don't be rude. Be polite. Or I'll kill you. Bill says, I had a close look at a can of spring of water... Uh, 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 what? I had a close look at a can of spring water and noticed that the water came from the Alps. The can is a nice thought, but not without a big carbon footprint bringing the water here. Yeah, for crying out loud, people, stop uh, buying water. Get water out of a tap. And um, why the constant thirst? I mean, it's it's not like we're uh, living in the middle of uh, the jungle or the or the middle of a desert. There's water every <coughs> water water everywhere. And we've got to take our own supply with us. You just go back in time thirty years. Nobody walked out of the house with with water. Yeah, people would wonder if you're going hiking. Why is everybody so blooming thirsty these days? Lucas says the permanent ice cap on uh, the Mont Blanc reduces year after year when it becomes just a boring high mountain there'll be no way of bringing it back even with multi-million euros donations and uh, this says tell that bloke that you have (coughs) (coughs) God what the hell was that stuff that blew in my face (coughs) and a month later I'm still coughing it up what is that don't tell me I (coughs) I I don't want to know. Oh, please, Doctor, you've got to help me. This says, Tell that bloke that you have to store nuclear waste in refrigerated underground pools of water forever or they blow up and kill everyone. (laughs) Yeah, but apart from that... That's uh, uh, in reference to a call I had uh, some while ago. Now, I'm going to talk about Jeremy Corbyn's brother in a minute, but first, here's a call in Camden. Hello, Claire. Oh, God. You, you've got to hit it really hard, which I'm loath to do because it is modern technology. But, you know, touch screens. You can't touch them. You've got to bash them. Ne- uh, tomorrow I'm going to bring in a hammer. So I'll try it again. Camden. Hello, Claire. Hi, hi Nick. There you are. Oh, thank you. Um, I want to give uh, you and, and people uh, uh, an Easter-themed tip. Easter-themed tip? Yes. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I'm it just praising uh, what we've had so far. I'm just uh, summarising uh, the call so far. So we're going to have an Easter-themed tip. Yes. <laughs> um, if you see a rabbit laying little brown eggs... A, a, a what um, now? Little brown no, eggs. No, but what? who's doing the laying? A rabbit. Oh, a rabbit. If you see a rabbit laying little brown eggs... <laughs> yes. <laughs> Don't eat them. It, it's not chocolate. Don't eat them. It's not chocolate. Right, that's good advice. (laughs) 
Oh, is that's that it? That's my tip. <laughs> that's, that's your that's tip. My tip. <laughs> <laughs> okay, excellent work. Thanks very much, Claire. If you see a rabbit laying little brown eggs, don't eat them. It's not chocolate. Disgusting. But it is packed full of goodness. Ulrika says, in addition to solar panels, we need efficiency battery banks to store the solar power. Sadly, no efficient batteries have been invented yet. Well, uh, Elon Musk, that uh, crazy guy with the electric cars and uh, just loads of other things besides, he's on the case. He's doing something about it. I think you can actually buy a battery that you store on the side of your house that does have the capacity to, um, I don't know, I've got no idea, (laughs) run your computer or uh, turn a light on. You know that that standby light on your TV? Yeah, it could run that. I have no idea, but it costs a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of money. And that's the problem at the moment. It's not efficient enough, and it's not cheap enough. But it, it bound, it's bound to go that way eventually, if people throw enough money at it. Because there's tons of money in it if they can uh, get it sorted. In it. Bill says, I had a... Cl- oh, I read that. Lucas says, no, I've read that. Rob says, uh, will Saudi Arabia fall into a massive sinkhole as fossil fuels are used at the same rate as water over Niagara Falls 24 hours a day? What? Will Saudi Arabia fall into a massive sinkhole as fossil fuels are used at the same rate as water over Niagara Falls 24 hours a day? Is that true? No. It can't be. But you, you, you do wonder about that. Well, I don't normally, but I do now. Saudi Arabia uh, sucking up vast amounts of oil, which is coincidentally underneath their feet. They didn't do anything to put it there. All those riches that they uh, flaunt with their purple cars and um, you know all the rest of it. They did absolutely nothing in order to get to get that. They didn't uh, use their um, adv- advanced knowledge of business, and they didn't um, use their cunning and their wile to get it. They just happened to, to uh, pitch their tent on an area where millions of years ago a mighty forest stood, and then it disintegrated and uh, turned to oil. And uh, bingo, they're in the money. And, and they're pulling it out from underneath their feet. So you would think that they'd be creating a hole underneath there. So maybe they will fall into a massive sinkhole. There's another excellent reason not to go on holiday there. Why anybody would want to go on holiday there, you people have got to be out of your minds. They put you in uh, prison if you call somebody a horse. <laughs> 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 or if you kiss if you kiss somebody that you shouldn't order. Or do anything else that they don't like the look of crazy. You know, people are flying over Italy to get to, to um, Saudi Arabia to go on holiday. You people are out of your minds. Uh, let's have a call in Brighton. Hello, Daniel. Hello, mate. You OK? Yes, fine, thanks. I'd rather go to Brighton on holiday than Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's nice at the moment with the sun, mate. Be honest, yeah. Yeah. It's not too bad. No, um, I mean, because I just wanted to make the point. You're saying about... Um, wind turbines and uh, solar panels and stuff hmm. just off the uh, coast of Brighton now they've uh, they've actually stuck uh, easily a hundred big wind turbines creating um, enough to, to power three 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 hundred and fifty thousand homes roughly um, I think and they're way next. way way offshore aren't they I quite like the look of them because you, you can't see them they're, they're not like uh, right in your face but if you no, concentrate on the horizon you can make them out you can see them just yeah, and that, to be honest, there was there was no big publicity about them. The first I knew about them, and anyone I know, is when, like you say, on the coast, and you you see them, and you think, "What's well, that?" Yeah, exactly. You you're, you're not immediately aware that there's a great uh, f- uh, f- like farm of these uh, wind um, turbines, and, and until you concentrate on the horizon, and then you can make them out. And, and once you, you can, can detect that they're there, they actually look quite nice. I like them. Yeah, yeah, they're not. Yeah, they're. Yeah, they're not unsightly to be fair, are they? But it's the amount of them. There is, you know, they, that about putting money into um, solar panels and the rest. That must have cost millions. I don't know yeah. how much, but it must have been an absolute fortune. I think that, um, and you know, you know who is uh, is really cashing in because um, everything that's just offshore for a couple of miles is a you know who's. Yeah, big money, huge. <laughs> No, fair play, fair so she's uh, she's doing just fine out of it. Don't worry about a thing. All right, good work. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Cheers, mate. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Yeah, you see them everywhere. Um, they're off the coast of Eastbourne, 
Uh, they look uh, very, very nice to me. I have no problem with them. Much better than being on land, where people do have a problem with them. I mean, I wouldn't want uh, I wouldn't want a wind farm near me. I mean, people I was talking to somebody last night who said that they uh, they make a bit of a racket and they reduce the price of your house, and nobody wants that. But uh, set them offshore, where of course the wind is mostly, and there ain't nobody living there to uh, complain. Sounds like an excellent idea. Uh, here's a call in Staines. Ugh. Tony. Hello, Nick. You always say, uh. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I was amused about this uh, green energy. Uh, about 20 years ago, I came up with an idea for um, using seawater to generate power. Seawater? Uh, yes. A hydroelectricity is the best way of producing electricity. And as you said before, you've got to store electricity. And a, a reservoir is a, basically a huge accumulator. The battery. Well, it does seem like l- logical. As we've got the moon, we might as well use it because it pulls oceans from one end to the other. So, the, I mean, the amount of power that is oh, created. Oh no, 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 no! It wasn't wasn't that way. It ah. was to use the wind turbines to pump the water into a, a coastal valley uh, using modular dams, so that the, the price would come down dramatically. And then you just release the water during peak hours which basically triples the power of every turbine. So you, you pump in for eight hours, and then you release it. It takes seven seconds to turn a turbine on, and you have the power when you want it, and it's reliable because it's, the water's there. Plus seven the seconds? Well. You've got to wait seven seconds to be... Um, Online, yeah. Oh, you've got to be kidding me, Tony. Nobody can wait seven seconds. Anyway, there, I, I couldn't get anybody interested in it, but apparently a, a Spanish professor came up with a similar idea uh, in, and was promptly funded by the EU uh, <laughs> on the island of El Hierro. Uh, he, used the, he actually desalinated the water at the same time and... Uh, they used it to run the generators and uh, irrigate the fields. Nice. But uh, he he was a professor, you see, so they listened to him. If you're an ordinary person, nobody's going to listen to you in this country. Well, in in this country, nobody's going to listen to you, whatever kind of person you are. Everybody's got yeah. their fingers in their ears and they're hum- <coughs> humming loudly to themselves in case they yeah. take on board a fact. But uh, it, it was, I, I think... We've got lots of technology that we don't actually use to its full extent yeah. because the system that I had in mind was just a, a bigger version of an existing hydro plant in Wales that was built about 30 years ago. They they pump the water up at night on off-peak electricity and then they use it to uh, boost the electricity in peak hours. And so this was just doing it on a massive scale, which would... Uh, Hydro, once you've put it up, it's not that expensive to put up. It's so reliable because um, it just doesn't really go wrong. It's been going on for 80, 90 years. Uh, and uh, if you, if only you'd um, patented this uh, idea, by this uh, time you could have been a millionaire, Tony. Well, uh, nobody would listen. Uh, nobody seemed to understand. It well, I know I don't. It's simple to me. <laughs> <laughs> It seemed quite simple to me, and uh, if you put up, uh, most of these valleys are just sitting there with a bit of heather in and a few... Yeah, not doing anything. Yeah, and... Uh, no good to anybody. Once, well, once you make it into a reservoir, you've got hydroelectricity, and yeah. you're using, you got using bee- seawater. You got, you've got beavers and, and everything. Running, mm. You run the seawater back into the sea. Right, it makes sense to me. You're not blocking any rivers. You're not blocking any rivers. And I'm only saying that for you to stop explaining it to me, because my head hurts (laughs) right now. I've just taken on board so much information on this show so far. I've actually got a headache. But, um, okay, good work. Leave it with me, Tony, and I'll uh, see what I can do. I'll see what I can do to just try and forget everything that I've learned on this program so far, because uh, I'm actually getting brain ache, because it's like being back at school. I've I've learnt plenty enough already. I learnt plenty enough about 20 years ago when I decided not to take on board another single fact. I don't need no more facts. I don't need no educating. Ulrika says in... No, I've read that. Ian in Camden says, what we need is basic income. What's that got to do with it? 
with the free time some human <coughs> with the free time some human will come up with a solution to the battery power issue possibly in their shed <laughs> Possibly not that shed owner. No, nobody wants to hear from that shed owner anymore. I think this is nonsense. Yes, thank you, Dave. Don't call us. We'll call you. We'll call you all sorts of things. None of them broadcastable, even on a podcast. Coming up, something I bet you didn't know and will find hard to believe about solar panels. Everything is going extremely well. You bet your life it is. Val in Wallington says, I have some concerns about the number of callers tonight, and also last night, who seem to know what they're talking about, and or have some pretty good ideas. I do hope this trend will not continue. God, me too, Val. All this information, I just can't take it on board. It's too much. Whinging and whining and moaning. It's like being back at school. Any moment now, I expect to get uh, sent to see the headmaster. 0345 6060 973. And there will not be a test at the end of this programme, by the way. You don't have to take on board any of this information. You can just stare out the window and let it all wash over you. Uh, here's another one. Barry St. Edmunds. Hello, Jeff. Hello. I've, I haven't heard the last 15 minutes, but I've been listening to your show about renewables. And I'm in the renewables industry, and I'd just like to make a few points because a couple of callers. Oh, my the- God. Here's another bloke who knows what he's talking about. Oh, no. Yes. Well, we have solar farms all over Suffolk and Norfolk, and England is a really good place to have solar panels. The is it? But the sun really never shines. Well, the problem with other countries where the sun shines too much is that solar panels become less efficient the hotter they get. So if you put them in a desert, they might run 20% less efficient because they're just getting too hot. Well, that's crazy. Who came up with that <laughs> uh, stupid notion? A, sun, <laughs> uh, a, a solar panel that doesn't like the sun. They don't. They don't like super heat. They like to be under 21 degrees. Well, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. I know, but we have to put up with it. And the other thing is the solar farms. Now, I was really against solar farms. I thought, you know, with all the room on all the rooftops, why on earth are we taking up all these fields? And then I spoke to a man who had dedicated his retirement to uh, helping nature and, uh, and dealing with bushes and birds and insects and things. And he said, these solar farms are excellent. He said, because the farmers have more or less bleached the fields with chemicals to get rid of all the insects, all the bugs, all the little animals. Yeah. He said, but the solar farm owners don't mind them scurrying around under their solar panels. So he said, it's almost like a meadow. He said, it literally is really good for the environment to have breaks between all these bleached agricultural fields where animals can actually thrive. Right. So the, in- the insects can come back. But yes. how close together and, and- do they put these solar panels? Well, they'll, they'll put them uh, edge to edge in rows, but they'll have to put them about two metres back from each other, two to three metres, because if one panel starts to shade another, obviously it ruins the efficiency of the panel behind it. Right. So there'll be two to three metres between each row. I mean, we've got loads of them in Suffolk and Norfolk. And they, um, and, and, but we have built, I mean, just out of the Cambridge where the wind farm is, there has got to be 10,000 panels across all those fields. Good so grief. Loads. I am stunned. This is completely new information to me. I would have bet money that we don't have any solar panel farms in this country. In places like Suffolk and Norfolk, where there's a lot of land, they, they do. One, one last point, if I can. Um, one of your callers was mentioning about putting solar panel on top of a car. Yeah. Um, it would take a 14-panel, 4-kilowatt system, two to three really good days to charge the big Tesla. So one panel on its roof is going to make very little difference. We'd, we'd, people would have to have like a football field of solar panels balanced on the top of their cars in order to uh, propel them to the shops and back. If they were like the Tesla, they would, yeah, they would. I mean, but a lot of people have done the right thing. What they've got is they've got a big solar system on their roof and then they, they, they use it to charge up their cars because obviously a full charge on a Tesla will do 450 miles and most people aren't doing 450 miles a week. So they'll have, they'll have 14 panels on their roof and they'll use it to charge their cars and essentially they've got free environmentally undamaging fuel. Well, you know what? I hadn't even thought about that. God, the stuff that I'm taking on board on this programme, I, I, my, my brain is, is hurting because it's actually getting bigger as I'm speaking. Well, can I tell you about one more development that's going to be the next big thing and the government are funding it? Yes. OK, it's heat pumps, air source heat pumps. So if you have a solar system on your roof and an air source heat pump, the air source heat pump will give you free heat and free hot water because the solar system will power it, and it is completely green. And heating our homes and our hot water is 25% of the environmental damage, or CO2, if you like. So 
the next big, and the government's giving people eleven and a half thousand pounds to make the conversion from oil or LPG or gas. Can they just give me eleven and a half thousand pounds, and I'll promise to do it later? No, they don't. And even if you do it today, they're going to take seven years to give it to you. But they will, they will give you extra. They'll give you the inflation, but they will take seven years to give you it back. Right. What's a heat pump? Basically, it works opposite to a refrigerator. So what it does is it draws in air, and it doesn't matter how cool the air is, as long as it's not below about minus thirty. It, it, it draws in air. It passes it over an F-type gas, and what that does is takes the the turns one kilowatt of energy, electricity, into three and a half kilowatts of heat. So if you have a, an electric heater, they're 100 percent efficient. They turn one kilowatt of energy into one kilowatt of heat. If you have a gas one, is they're 90 percent efficient. One kilowatt of electricity, 0.9 of a kilowatt of heat. An air source heat pump turns one kilowatt of electricity into three and a half kilowatts of heat by taking two and a half of those kilowatts out of the air by passing them over an F-type gas. So it works opposite to your fridge. Your fridge draws in air, passes it over an F-type gas, passes it through a compressor. That's what makes it cold. If you use a different gas, it works the other way around and it heats it up. Obviously, these things are quite big because they've got to heat a whole house, not freeze a small fridge. Phew. Well, um, okay. Is this going to be on the test? Uh, yeah, yeah, I will be sending it to test. <laughs> <laughs> and it has a 90% pass rate, so good luck with that. <laughs> Right, OK, well, uh, thanks for the news, uh, Jeff. Yeah, Cheers, mate. OK, ta-da. 0345 6060 973. My God, this programme is in danger of becoming intelligent. And well, we don't want that. Patrick in Guildford says, uh, What Brighton gained ecologically with their wind turbines, they lost aesthetically when the city awoke one day to find that goddamn ugly totem pole living over the seafront. Oh, that thing, <laughs> yes. <laughs> that thing. He's talking about the, the 360 thing. It's this giant pole on... Uh, it's right opposite where the burnt um, pier is. You know that Brighton's got two pier... Well, one and a half piers. It's got a pier... Oh, speaking of piers, by the way, Jeremy Corbyn's brother is called Piers. I, I still haven't got around to talking about him there yet. But yeah, Brighton has got... Uh, the, the pier that burnt down, very suspiciously, by the way, there was a very suspicious amount of piers burning all at the same time. Hmm. And I think this one burnt over and over again. If at first you don't succeed, keep, keep burning it down, and then eventually people will give up. And there it stands in the water, a disconsolate skeleton of what used to be great, unfortunately. And right opposite, they've stuck this huge pole with a doughnut that goes up and down. Which, come to think of it, is a little bit... Disgusting. A little bit. Now that I've thought about it, it's a little bit disgusting. <laughs> uh, have you been up it? Oh, it is frightening. <coughs> it really is. It's terrifying. It, you go up and you, you get in this glass donut and it goes up a pole. And it goes up and up and up. And um, you, I, I started retreating away from the glass the higher it got. And I thought, there's no way it can go up uh, any further. This is plenty high enough. We don't need to go up any further. And then you look up through the glass roof of the donut that you're in, and you realise you're only about a third of the way up this blooming pole. Oh, no. And then you keep, you keep going up and up and up, and you think there can't be any air left to go into. I'll be shaking hands with the people from the International Space Station any moment now, I thought. It was absolutely terrifying. You never get me up in one of those again. But I think it looks all right, kind of, a little bit. But anyway, Patrick and Guilford says, what Brighton gained ecologically with their win... And, and I'm going to read this again because he's, he's completely correct uh, spelling all the way through. And some of these words are difficult. What Brighton gained ecologically with their wind turbines, they lost aesthetically when the city awoke one day to find that goddamn ugly totem pole looming over the seafront. Was Caroline Lucas asleep when the scaffolding went up? There's serious dosh slopping around in Brighton, and yet just a little way down the coast, relatively bankrupt Pompeii can afford that gorgeous spinnaker tower. P Pompeii. Pompey. Pompeii. <laughs> Idiot. What on earth were they thinking? That spinnaker tower is quite nice. In Portsmouth. I quite like it. It's very nice, as, uh, as a matter of fact. The spinnaker tower. And you can go up that too, and you feel uh, you know relatively safe, because it's a proper building. But the uh, that totem pole on Brighton Seafront, that is alarming. It looks OK from the ground, just don't go up in it. That's my recommendation to you.
The stuff you're learning on this show, it's, um, it is educational, isn't it? Affirmative. Uh, it's the only time I've ever been able to say that, yes, that is the case on this program. And this is the last time I ever want this to happen. From tomorrow, we go back to being stupid again. Are you with me? James says, uh, the Netherlands ceased all fracking last year after it caused billions worth of damage over several years to properties through subsidence. So naturally, our government is thinking long and hard before giving it the go-ahead. Oh, no, that's right. They're issuing licenses left, right and centre. Well, America is making an enormous amount of money on uh, uh, by uh, fracking, by which method they are um, weaning themselves off dependence on the oil Gulf states, the Gulf oil states. Uh, see, I'm the one that's bringing stupidity back to this show. You're welcome. Thank you. The Gulf oil states, they're weaning themselves off the dependency of, which is a good idea. Um, we, we should do it straight away, if not sooner. But the problem is, in doing that, you've got the fracking part. Plus, you have to actually say the word fracking a lot. Dreadful. And alarm bells are ringing in my mind every time I say it. Warning, warning. And that's it. If you subscribe to this podcast, you'll find the next episode gets squirted up your life as though by magic on Mondays. And don't forget the podcast that I do with Carol McGiffin, which is called What's Your Problem with Nick and Carol? In which Carol McGiffin and I have a right laugh while trying to solve people's problems. And if you would like us to try to solve your problem, send it to the following address. Nick and Carol at global.com. N-I-C-K-A-N-D-C-A-R-O-L at global.com. And prepare to be completely satisfied. I also do a podcast called The Whole Show, which is, as it sounds, the whole show from my stint on the radio with the ads and the news taken out, which makes it quicker to listen to. And I'll be back on the radio Friday, Saturday and Sunday night at 10. And until then, I'll be seeing you. Bye bye.